Kia ora, um, welcome to the Aspen Ambassadors Talk hosted by two partners of the Aspen International, International Network, New Zealand and Germany, where we explore some of the most pressing issues facing our world today. I'm Christine Maiden-Sharp, the Executive Director of the Aspen Institute in New Zealand, and I have the privilege of opening this dialogue between our two ambassadors, Ambassador Hawke and Ambassador Mensenbach, who will be discussing German-New Zealand ties and changing geopolitical realities. Stormy, uh, Annika Mildner, my counterpart, will now introduce our moderator and panel. Over to you, Stormy. Good morning um, to everybody on this side um, <laughs> of the Atlantic and Pacific, depending on which way you go. And um, good evening um, on the other side. Um, it's also a great pleasure welcoming all of you. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Christine, for the introduction, but also for joining up um, in, this, in this discussion. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our um, two speakers of today and our wonderful moderator. So it's um, it's it's a pleasure welcoming uh, Craig Hawk. Um, Craig, um, maybe you can wave so that everybody sees you. Um, all of there he is, um, <laughs> and um, he is currently New Zealand's ambassador to Germany, Switzerland, the Czech Republic, and Liechtenstein. So quite a bit of traveling, but we have the pleasure actually to share the same building and the same floor. So we lovingly also just call ourselves neighbors. Um, and uh, Craig, thank you so much um, for being here this uh, this early morning. Um, and um, uh, I know that um, you follow very closely the Munich uh, Security Conference over the last couple of days, uh, three days. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, about that as well um, later on. You held many, many different um, positions around the world, but also in um, the foreign ministry. But one of, the, one of the positions I wanted to point out is that you were the permanent representative and ambassador to the United Nations, New York, 2017 to 2021. I'm pretty sure there was a very interesting interesting time over there um, in New York. It's also a great pleasure welcoming our, and I say our German, um, Ambassador Nicole Metzenbach um, here in our uh, meeting today. Um, she has been the German Ambassador to New Zealand since October 2022. So she is very young, so to say, um, in New Zealand. And also she held many different um, positions in her past, both in our foreign office as well as around the world. And her last position was um, that she served as Council General of Germany to um, the New England states from 2018 to 2022. And last but not least, um, I want to introduce our moderator um, of today, um, Sir Don McKinnon. He is former New Zealand politician and diplomat who served as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs. And you also was a member of Parliament for the National Party. And you could also be a speaker um, today, but we decided to make you a moderator because there is nobody else who could moderate such a diplomat diplomat's talk better than you. Thank you so much. And I hand over to you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much indeed. It, it is a great pleasure to uh, join this group. I always get uh, pretty excited when there's a, a chance to sort of come back into the discussions about foreign policy, wherever they are. But when I say to young people, particularly, I began my life as a foreign minister 33 years ago, they regard me as a sort of a First World War veteran. Nevertheless, it's always good to join with people, especially on both sides of the world. New Zealand's relationship with uh, Germany for a long period of time has been very much a trade-related one. We've always recognised Germany as a, as a very, very strong economy, uh, an economy that has enormous influence in Europe and around the world. Uh, so I'm very glad to meet the new German ambassador in New Zealand, Nicole Metzenbach, and hope she has a good tour here. And of course, uh, New Zealand ambassador and currently in Berlin, uh, Craig Hawke, whom I've known most of his diplomatic life and can say that he has always been one of the stars of our diplomatic service. And I certainly congratulate him on for the role he is playing in Berlin, in Germany at the present time. 
reading a little bit about, of course, the conference in Munich just in the last day or so, uh, I fully understand that that conference would be and should be dominated by what's happening in Ukraine right now. I have a little sidebar comment that an old friend of mine was one of your ministers, Joska Fisher. When I was meeting with him about six months ago, he said, you know, this attack on Ukraine for Germany is finally the end of World War II. And I thought that was a very prophetic remark. And certainly from our side of the world, watching what is happening in Germany now, in recognition of what's happening in Ukraine, is very, very significant for the whole world. But I think this is time for calling on both uh, the two ambassadors to say a few remarks, and then we can, uh, we'll take the story wherever it goes. So Ambassador Metzenbach, please kick it off. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, so good evening, Kiora from Wellington, and uh, good morning nach Berlin. Um, Good to be here with all of you and um, thank you for having me. So um, yeah, Putin's war of aggression has changed um, Europe, has changed Germany. Uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz called the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine a turning point, a turning point of German history, a 180 degree shift. For the first time, the German government is supplying uh, weapons to a country at war. This is something, you know, no one could have imagined one year ago. It's a really, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a Zeitenwende as turning point um, in Germany. Today, Germany is the third largest um, donor in terms of weapons, um, uh, in terms of military supply to Ukraine. Uh, and this turning point, uh, as Olaf Scholz called it, um, it's truly a sea change. A sea change in foreign policy, a sea change in security and defense policy, and a sea change in our energy policy. Um, so um, this is something really um, uh, very new to us. We came a long way. Um, um, Germany has changed um, a lot in the last year. So, but let me stop um, by saying this. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it is, it is the topic number one, of course, in Germany. We will uh, commemorating uh, one year of Putin's invasion of Ukraine on Friday. We will um, organize something here um, in Wellington with the EU um, member states um, ambassadors and the G7 ambassadors, maybe the G20, uh, G20 will uh, show up. And it's so important that we show solidarity. And it is so important for Germany that um, New Zealand um, from the from day one, it took a very firm position in condemning this war of aggression. Thank you for this. Thank you very much. Now, I think Craig, I'm sure you can give a, a good uh, few comments on this, but you may like to tell your German audience, you know, why New Zealand has got itself involved in the Ukraine situation. Um, thanks, Sidon, and uh, kia ora, um, good evening to, to New Zealand, and um, uh, guten morgen to everyone um, who's tuning in here in Germany and in Europe. Um, it's great to see um, some uh, old friend Sidon and uh, uh, many uh, years of uh, uh, watching you uh, um, lead New Zealand's foreign policy um, and then also work on the global stage. So um, great to be sharing this platform with you and also my counterpart, Nicole. Um, can't think of a greater way of, of, of two of us doing the same job for our, our, our countries um, um, in, in what's a fairly challenging time at the moment. Um, and always great to do this with the Aspen Institute as well and our neighbor Stormy and, and great to see Christina leading the charge in, in New Zealand. Um, uh, Nicole said that 
uh, the invasion, uh, Russian invasion, Ukraine had changed Germany. And I guess I would say also, it's probably changed New Zealand. And one thing to say is that New Zealand very much is a Pacific country. It's anchored and grounded in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and when we look at the world, we look up and out, but we're also a very outward facing nation. Uh, you know, we rely on trade for our prosperity. We're a very open, liberal country. So we're looking for partners and we're looking for friends to work with. And why I say it's changed is because as a smaller state, we really rely on the international rules-based order. And there is now a sense that those international rules and the rules-based order has some contestability in it. So as a small state, again, uh, New Zealand is going to look for friends. And I think I've been here almost a year, nine months, and Germany is a country that we are going to be increasingly seeking to work with. Um, and I've been struck by the commonality of interests and values and also views um, in my discussions here. And you may wonder how can that be when our geographies are so different and our scale is so different. And I think it goes back to some of those principles that we believe in around democratic institutions, uh, human rights, uh, and multilateralism. And I've really found a commonality of thought um, and thinking, um, but we need to work more closer together. And I think why is the Ukraine um, uh, invasion uh, changed New Zealand? I think it's it's making us think much more around our own sense of security and our own sense of prosperity and what that means in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and I think those are the same things that Nicole very um, uh, um, well articulated for Germany. And it's very, very real sitting here in Berlin, how close the war feels. And it may feel a long way away from New Zealand. Um, However, some of those principles around territorial integrity um, and the international rules-based order is some of the reasons that are grounding why New Zealand has been so supportive of Ukraine and showing solidarity for Europe. And um, as we speak, we, you know, we have um, both provided uh, uh, non-lethal and lethal aid. We're providing support with coordination and for the first time ever, we've put in place autonomous sanctions. Um, and this is a big step for New Zealand. Previously, our sanctions were under United Nations mandated sanctions regimes. So uh, for us, um, uh, geography now knows no boundaries. And therefore, some of those principles around international law um, for a small state like New Zealand means that we're going to want to have more of Germany in terms of our engagement and relationship. Thanks, Sidon. Thank you very much, Craig. Can I come back to you, Ambassador Metzenbach? Um, as I said earlier, Germany's had long trading relationships all around the world. Historically, of course, you, you had interests in this part of the world pre-1920. Uh, do you see your role in the Indo-Pacific as having more than a trading relationship for the next decade? Yes, um, sure. So first of all, let me, let me mention that Germany is not a Pacific power, not like New Zealand or Australia or even France. But we do have interests, of course, in the Pacific region. The Indo-Pacific is important, is an important region for us uh, and for Europe, not only because of the economic growth and the international trade routes, but also because of climate change um, and the geopolitical competition in the region. What is important for us is that we uh, take an inclusive approach in this. We want to work together with all the partners in the region. This is a very important point. 
Um, so Germany has decided to, to intensify um, its activities and to enhance its visibility um, in the Indo-Pacific um, region. Um, in this context, we have decided to, uh, to join the US-led initiative partners in the Blue Pacific. We did this together with, uh, with Canada. Uh, we have been a um, Pacific Island Forum dialogue partner since 2016. And uh, we are currently preparing um, the setup of a new permanent um, German diplomatic mission in Suva, in Fiji, and we, um, we uh, this new embassy will be opening in uh, this year, in July, uh, end of July. Um, so um, this um, region is important for us. Um, I'm quite new to the, to the, to the Pacific. Um, the embassy in Wellington is covering six Pacific island states. And um, when I speak to the high commissioners here in, in Wellington, or I travel to the Cook Islands, and I will be traveling to, to Fiji uh, next week, is that um, Germany enjoys a very high reputation. We are perceived in the Pacific, we are perceived as a reliable partner with a um, as a competent partner, especially in the in the in terms of um, the climate policy, um, and so um, the new engagement is um, very much appreciated uh, in the Blue Pacific, and of course, it's also about trade, and it's about. Um, uh, 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 Transparing, transparing, uh, transparent and open international trading routes. We need um, as a um, as a trading nation like New Zealand, and so it's um, yeah, it's it's becoming um, more and more important for us. Thank you very much for that. And I think we could uh, say to our or our friends listening here that um, those of us in the Pacific, of course, the the phrase Indo-Pacific is relatively new. For a long time, it was always the Asia-Pacific, which uh, stressed, of course, the, 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 across the Pacific, uh, from, from the Americas right across to Japan down to Indonesia. Clearly, the uncertainty concerning China's aspirations uh, caused a few of those big thinkers in Washington, D.C. to uh, stretch their interests a bit further and consequently bringing India very firmly and to some extent the three Islamic countries very firmly into the sort of Pacific area becoming the Indo-Pacific. Now, whether it's a, an attempt to uh, completely circular go around China, maybe it. And I, I can say these things not being a, a civil servant in anybody's country, but Certainly, the Indo-Pacific is very much a, a recent creation, uh, and I think clearly of concern at China's uh, current expansion, but that's another debate entirely. Craig, how do you get on in uh, Berlin talking about the Indo-Pacific? Do you have listeners? Um, th th thanks, Don. I, I, it's been very heartening to be here and to understand you know, the, the huge amount of effort that has to go into thinking about European security architecture and what's happening in the war um, in Ukraine, um, that the amount of time that um, the German system is thinking about the Indo-Pacific. And I think um, Nicole's outline of what Germany has been doing has been very heartening um, and uh, very pleasing. And what I would say is that New Zealand was very pleased to see the Indo-Pacific guidelines. Um, this was um, Germany's um, framing of how it saw the region. And I think just simply the scale and the size of Germany as a G7 economy, um, we see Germany as a force for good um, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we want to see more Germany, but we understand the preoccupations at the moment, um, but we have seen um, 
really a fantastic um, increase in engagement across defense, um, development, and diplomacy. And I think what we are wanting is we aren't seeking more militarization in our region. What we are wanting is a secure and prosperous region. And we know that need, that means we need to have respect for international law. We need to have open sea lanes. Um, we need to have an inclusive approach to solving regional issues. Um, and that means dialogue and conversations with, with all. And um, we see Germany increasingly as being, being part of that. Um, and in particular, I would note the, the recent conversations I've had here around Germany's thinking around the Pacific. And I know here in Berlin, it's probably a, a you know, it's a, it's a challenging conversation to have around what a footprint looks like in, 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 the, in a region a long way away geographically. Um, but I would argue that some of the issues today, we touched on them, climate change, and uh, broadly um, uh, pro uh, security requires a G7 nation to have a presence and an engagement um, in the region um, or understand the region, region's um, needs. So some of those conversations can be taken pl place in international fora and multilateral settings. So I would say it's very, been very, very pleasing um, in terms of, of the conversation around um, the Indo-Pacific. Um, we can see some very practical things that Germany is, is doing. Um, and I think uh, uh, Germany's voice matters, um, I would say, not only in the region, but Germany's voice matters in the conversations it has with China, the conversation it has with India, and the conversation it has with the US about the region. I think that's a very, a very good assessment, uh, and maybe uh, Ambassador Nicole would like to advance that. Bringing into, bringing into the debate, we have to assume in New Zealand that uh, Germany will continue to promote open and free trade from within the European Union, as they have been very good for many years, and of course the ongoing support for liberal democracies, because they are somewhat under threat in many parts of the world. Yeah, um, as uh, Craig said, so the Indo-Pacific plays a key role in, uh, in shaping the international in the, in the future. So, and that's why we are working closely together with the partners in the region. When we had our G7 presidency last year, um, Olaf Scholz, our chancellor, invited India and Indonesia um, to the summit. So we are... Um, we are trying to uh, to include um, um, the um, very important um, uh, nations here. We are. It is not in a confrontation between China and the not in our interest. We need to stand up for our values and interests in the region. At the same time, we need to work together with China um, uh, uh, because of um, the global challenges like climate change, peace and security. China is a is a has a permanent seat in the in the um, in the U.S. Security Council. So um, there is no other option to um, that we are that we are working together with China and working together with the other with the other nations. So India is important. Indonesia is important, Japan, Korea, and um, yeah, we, uh, as I said, we are, we are pursuing a inclusive approach um, in the Indo-Pacific. So the, 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 one of the, 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 one of the, the main reason, of course, why we want to engage our, um, our in, uh, enhance our engagement in the region is, of course, the effects of climate change. And we feel uh, responsible um, to support here uh, because you, you don't see um, the effects of climate change that, that much than in the, in the Indo-Pacific. 
So we feel that we um, need to play a role here. We need. We feel that we need to take responsibility, um, and um, uh, uh, in terms of funding and supporting um, the Pacific Island states, this agenda and um, um, and this we will do in the line of the 2050 strategy um, of the blue Pacific um, of the blue uh, of the blue Pacific so this strategy the 18 Pacific island countries uh, agreed on and um, yeah this is um, this is what we um, intend to do well, thank you very much. And I think that brings the issue of climate change to the fore, because uh, if there's one thing we know about our neighbours in the Pacific, I think there are two, two very significant Pacific islands, both Kiribati and Tuvalu, both of which are not more than two metres above sea level for their whole, whole landmass. And it's not a question so much of the, the sea running over the top of the land, but ultimately the, the land is so drenched in saline that it's impossible for them to grow vegetables and plants. So uh, we in the Pacific are kind of still scratching our heads. You know, what happens when these people can no longer live on those islands? They, if they become unlivable, what happens? 200,000 people in uh, Kiribati and 10,000 people in Tuvalu. Many other Pacific islands, of course, have hills or mountains that people can retreat to, but there are some real challenges here in the Pacific and there's no real easy answers for that. Craig? Um, I, I look, I totally agree with you. I mean, climate climate change is an existential issue and um, um, those examples you gave, Sir Don, show what it, what it means in the Pacific. But maybe I, I could just say, I mean, um, and having seen um, from afar the, the cyclone that's devastated New Zealand and, and thoughts go out to all of those um, who are still um, grappling with, with the um, enormous devastation. It shows, um, and also here in, in Germany, almost a year ago, huge floods in the west of Germany. It just shows that um, climate change knows no boundaries. Um, and if I can bring it back slightly to a a New Zealand-Germany bilateral connection, if anything that I have realized here is that um, the, co the conversation and engagement that we're going to need with Germany for our own transition away from fossil fuels, that Germany will be a central part of that. And uh, so Don, you mentioned um, the trade relationship and uh, that's incredibly important. And, um, you know, we are, um, uh, on a positive path to an EU New Zealand free trade agreement, um, which is concluded, but we now need to move it to implementation through signing and ratification. And it remains a key goal, I think, for, for, for New Zealand in terms of our, our prosperity and ability to have diversific diversification in our markets. Um, but what people don't probably know as much is that Germany is our largest science, research and innovation partner. And a huge amount of that is coming through the climate area. Um, and uh, it's been great here to see the number of hydrogen partnerships that are, um, uh, are being uh, are connected. Um, the whole issue of sustainable aviation fuels um, and the future of New Zealand's um, aviation sector um, has a huge engagement with Germany. Um, Christchurch Airport has just signed an agreement with Hamburg Airport. Airbus and Air New Zealand are looking at sustainable aviation fuels. Um, and also uh, Fonterra has just signed an agreement with um, uh, MAN, uh, a German company to look at um, heat pumps going into uh, its uh, milk powder drying factories. Um, so one, I think it shows that actually New Zealand's transition has a huge German aspect to it. But then secondly, I think uh, more globally, uh, we are looking to work with Germany to um, set the international framework to support, I guess, that uh, net zero by 2050. And uh, 
as uh, Nicole has said, Germany has got both heft and resources in, um, in, that, in that discussion. Um, and I think we also in our neighborhood um, and particular issues like loss and damage are ones where we are teaming up together to support our, our region in terms of this uh, uh, you know, existential threat over the, the coming decades. Uh, Thank you. And on a more domestic nature, I can say that New Zealand business people, now that we're past the COVID period and opening up our borders, are looking forward to those many hundreds of uh, German students who would normally come to New Zealand for six months or a year uh, in a sort of a gap year, uh, working in the restaurants, on the ski fields, on farms and orchards. And they provided a very, very substantial part of our temporary workforce. And uh, I think most of them enjoyed, enjoyed the time they were here. So hopefully those doors will open again via our immigration people. Nicole. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. I just want to add that I, uh, I came to New Zealand in, in September and then I traveled to, uh, to Christchurch and um, I was so impressed by the, by the large number of German universities cooperating with the University of Canterbury in the field of Antarctica and, and, um, and climate change and climate policy. This was really, um, this is this really a, a good thing. So they, they cooperate and we, you know, they do this, you know. And um, so, um, yeah, we have a strong um, science and research um, uh, cooperation. Um, and very good news is, of course, that um, New Zealand just um, have, has the um, accession to, to the horizon, to the EU Horizon 2020 program. That means that. Um, um, New Zealanders, New Zealand researchers can apply for EU funding, um, which is brings us closer together and which is very important because these young students and researchers, uh, the, they are our future. So um, regarding the um, FTA, I just forgot to mention, yeah, the FTA um, free trade agreement with New Zealand is a huge step as an important agreement between the EU and New Zealand. Uh, and we encouraging the EU to uh, have also a free trade agreement with uh, Australia. So we are about to start in, in negotiations and uh, we are aiming or we, we um, um, uh, want the EU um, to start also FTAs with India and uh, Indonesia in terms of free trade and uh, in the region. Thank and, you very uh, much. You know, the, the great uh, issue of the uh, involvement of the Aspen Institute and Aspen Germany and Aspen New Zealand is bringing, bringing people together. So. All of you folk in the audience here are now well entitled to ask questions of whoever you wish to ask, obviously. You obviously have to put your flag up on your screen so that we uh, notice you. Um, and, and naturally, being the chair, I like to think that all questions are questions rather than just long statements, but you've got some very talented, uh, well-educated people here and the two ambassadors, uh, and uh, feel free to open up another part of the debate. Uh, we, we've sort of skirted across the surface of a number of issues, but uh, I'm unpleased with what I'm hearing, the desire for Germany to become more engaged in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Germany's a, a massive economic power, and there is a huge amount of scope for those kind of relationships to develop uh, in, this, in this part of the world. So I'm looking around for a hand that might be up and we can invite that person to make a contribution by way of a question. We have Andrea Rotta, so if we could give her the floor. Thank you. Uh uh, thank you so very much. My name is Andrea Rotter. I'm um, a think tanker based in Munich. Um, so I want to thank the Aspen Institute for um, providing us 
with the opportunity to speak um, to uh, or to get an insight into the New Zealand politics and perspective, because here in Europe and especially in Germany, we tend to have a very Eurocentric and transatlantic view. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I have two questions for Ambassador Hawke. Um, first being on Germany's China strategy that is due in a couple of months. And I know as an ambassador, you probably will not um, want to comment on another country's strategic process. But if you could recommend or if you could get any, give any input in what Germany should emphasize or focus more on um, in our new China strategy, because it is a topic that is widely debated here in Germany, how our future approach to Germany might look like or even change. So I'd be interested in that perspective. And the second question would be, since I work on um, transatlantic security cooperation um, within NATO, for instance, um, of course, also we have a very transatlantic view, but ever since, uh, but I know that there has been strong ties between NATO and New Zealand ever since the early 2000s. So I'd be really interested in where you would like um, our cooperation within NATO and um, New Zealand like to increase, be it maritime security or cyber defense, or where do you feel that New Zealand and NATO could cooperate more and should that do that in more depth? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, two very good questions. I mean, I, we're watching very much with, with interest. Um, the, the development of the of the, the China strategy and um, I, I think um, uh, you know li like New Zealand but from different aspects the the importance of the relationship with China um, means that there's lots of opportunities but there are lots of challenges and there's lots of complexities um, and what I would say is that um, uh, we think that um, Germany's voice as I said matters in its engagement with with China. Um, and you know, it, it's really up for the for the government here to look at how its its thinking um, will be. But it clearly wants a framework around that, um, and to bring in the different parts of of the the political, the economic, the defence, the the trade uh, re relationship. So um, you, you're right; it's always a, 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 a something that you you step cautiously on 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 uh, um, uh, on any kind of advice. I guess what, what I would say though is that we are following it very, very closely because like uh, the importance of, of China and New Zealand's um, relationship um, is, is, is very large. It's an extremely important relationship for us. It's our largest trading partner. It's part of the Indo-Pacific. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are areas that we, that we work closely with China on. There are some areas that we, we, don't, uh, we don't work so closely together. Um, but we aim to be a very predictable um, partner and responsible in our engagement. Uh, so that's for, for where we want to, to go. And we encourage, I guess, um, that, that kind of um, dialogue and engagement in, 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 in other countries' dealings with China as well. On the, on the, 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 the NATO relationship, um, the, uh, our, our, our former Prime Minister Ardern met um, uh, the Chancellor Schultz at the, la the last NATO summit uh, in Madrid in uh, last year. Um, and that was sort of as part of what we now call the Asia Pacific Four um, with, our, with our friends in Japan, Korea, um, South Korea and Australia. And I think that, that, that kind of um, framing and grouping shows that uh, we, um, have some shared interests in a very close engagement with NATO, particularly at the moment um, with what's happening um, uh, um, in Ukraine. So I think that it's it's a relationship of possibilities. Um, it, it, it's 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 what it is. NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, so it very much is around transatlantic security. Um, so I think the relationship will be a different one when you're talking in, in, the, in the conversation around the Indo-Pacific security challenges. Um, but certainly uh, the conversations and some of those future areas, um, I, I was struck that when the Indo-Pacific is fundamentally a maritime domain, whereas the, in Europe, it's very much a, a continental 
security domain. So those are very, very different domains. So certainly conversations on maritime, some of those uh, asymmetrical areas of, of warfare, cyber is, is huge, um, are, are going to be areas that we're going to want to share um, uh, conversations for, for countries that, share, that really share and alliances that share the same kind of values. Thank you. <clears throat> Have we another hand identified, which I cannot see? I can't see any hands either right now, so I would also invite everybody to come in. But if I may, I would also love to ask a question. May I? Please do. And there the next hand also comes up. So let me quickly come in with my question. Um, Craig, uh, since you mentioned that it is very much about maritime um, security and cyber plays a big role, keeping open sea lanes is a really big issue um, also for countries like us because so much of world trade comes through the Indo-Pacific. Um, so let me ask a let me ask a question at the Munich uh, sec, at, at the Munich Security Conference. There was also quite a bit of talk about China and Taiwan, and most uh, people said there wouldn't be an invasion invasion like Russia invading Ukraine, um, but there could be blockages blockages um, or cyber attacks or um, uh, or any kind of other um, really hard sanctions um, on Taiwan. And I wanted to understand what that actually would mean for New Zealand and if you're prepping for this. <laughs> well, that's a very, very good question. I mean, one thing to start with, just to say that, um, I mean, uh, Taiwan is a very important economic relationship for us. Um, and um, New Zealand uh, was the first OECD country actually to have a um, economic um, framework uh, agreement with, um, uh, with, with Taiwan. And so the, the, the economic and the, the people to people links are, are, are big. So there would be a, you know, I mean, I don't want to get into too many um, hypotheticals here, but I think any kind of um, uh, constraints to any sea lanes is a huge issue for New Zealand. Um, you know, as I said, I started at the beginning saying that we're a trading nation, we're an outward facing nation. Um, we need freedom of navigation um, and the importance of the, uh, the, the law of the sea for, a, for, a, for an island nation like New Zealand is, in, is, is, is huge. Um, so uh, we are going to do everything we can um, within the multilateral setting, working with others to ensure some of those principles that we have all signed up to um, are maintained, um, irrespective of what some of the the security challenges which are going to evolve over time are going to are going to be. Um, uh, we, you know, it goes without saying in terms of that that broader. In engagement. We have a one China policy that was established in 1972. Um, uh, that remains the framework in terms of our engagement. And uh, however, we have a very thriving, as I said, economic and cultural relationship with Taiwan. And um, it remains a priority to see that that remains robust and um, uh, you know it continues for mutual prosperity. There's some very good points there, and I, and I think for our friends in uh, Germany, it's worthwhile noting just the, these rapid changes that have occurred. And I speak as one who first went to China, I think about 35 years ago, and I watched with amazement and awe at the way China just opened up its economy under Deng Xiaoping, under Li Peng, and then of course, um, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and every one of those leaders seemed to be bringing China more into the overall world of trade and uh, even heading towards liberal democracies. And then suddenly Xi Jinping comes along and decides he is not too enthusiastic about opening up anymore. And he also decides that the Communist Party must have much more rigorous control on the economy. And he told the whole world that he was going to clamp down on corruption. Uh, but unfortunately, everything started to go backwards. 
and it's very hard to know just where this is going to end up. But I think you should remember that in relation to Taiwan, you know, 30 years ago, Taiwan represented 50%, 50% of the total Chinese economy. It now represents about 8% of the total Chinese economy. The largest portion of foreign investment in Taiwan comes from mainland China. And Taiwanese are some of the biggest investors in mainland China. So there's a real mix going on there. It's pretty hard to understand where it is going to end up. Are people prepared to go to war over Taiwan? It's a big, big question. I wouldn't like to answer that today. Now we have two hands up and um, someone will uh, uh, pick up the name here. <laughs> Anita Perkins, please. I think there was someone in the chat before me, so perhaps they should go first. As you like. Oh, oh it, it'll be your next door neighbor, Martin Weavers, of course, in the shade. Martin Weavers, the yeah. floor. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for, for the conversation. Um, I, I'm like like Don and Katie uh, and Christina, I'm a trustee of the Aspen New Zealand Institute, so it's a, a great pleasure to have you all participating. Um, good evening, Craig, good to see you. Uh, my question is to Ambassador Mensenbach. Um, there was a comment earlier, I think, from Craig um, and also from Andrea about a, a sort of a NATO focus, a transatlantic focus for um, uh, Germany. And when you think of the G7, um, the UK, the US, France, Japan, Canada, um, those five members of the G7 are in fact all Pacific powers as well. The only two non-Pacific powers of the G7 are Germany and Italy. Um, and my question to you is, uh, I don't know whether you can answer this or not, um, although it's a very trans, we see the G7 as a very transatlantic industrialized nation focus. Um, do they ever talk about the Pacific and the interest they have in the Pacific? Because five of the seven G7 nations are Pacific powers. That's my question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, so as I said, um, yeah, they're talking about the, the Indo-Pacific, as I uh, mentioned earlier, that um, um, in, in, in the context of our G7 presidency, um, we invited um, um, uh, India and Indonesia uh, to the G7 meetings. So um, I can't speak about Italy, but uh, for Germany, I can say that we want to be, you, you know, you, we are not a Pacific power, and, um, uh, but we want to be more visible and we want to uh, engage more uh, in, the, uh, in the Pacific. Thank you. Now we'll come back to Anita Perkins. Paul uh, Marie, Beziehungsweise, guten Morgen. Um, my question is for Ambassador Hawk and for Ambassador Metzenbach. Um, I think you're both relatively um, early in your um, in your terms, if I've got that right. Um, so I'd be interested in, firstly, um, what have you found most surprising or kind of unexpected about the New Zealand-German relationship? And secondly, um, during your term um, as ambassadors, um, what would be kind of like the top thing or one thing you'd really like to focus on in terms of where the relationship is going? Thanks. Craig. Right. Longer, you're longer. You go first to call me. Uh, me. Okay. Um, uh, uh, in, in, in nine months, uh, Anita, um, you realize that you come here as an amateur to the relationship. Um, but, uh, and you have got a, a limited time. So one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, New Zealand always learns that we need to be incredibly focused about what we are, what we are doing. So um, it was very nice to be here after a month to have the FDA concluded, um, which obviously is an EU competency, but, you know, as an ambassador here, I'll, I'll claim a piece of that, that kind of um, um, credit. Um, but I, I think I, wanted to say that what surprised me most has been the depth of that 
um, research, science, innovation relationship. And I think, again, Nicole touched on about her visits down to Canterbury. I mean, it's right across from student exchanges, it's to university partnerships, it's to applied research, it's actually to government to government actually fostered funding. Um, since I've been here, we have signed an agreement on space cooperation, and we now have eight projects in the space area. And I did not think that I would be um, you know, signing an agreement on cooperation on space, but not just signing, you know, ambassadors can sign agreements all the time, but it's actually having underneath it tangible activity and cooperation um, happening. So I think that for me is um, been the most surprising and pleasing aspect of the relationship. And, and very quickly on your second one, um, look, I think for me, and this may sound rather kind of um, broad, but the whole issue around sustainability, um, I think uh, our future and our trade is a sustainable one. Um, and we're grappling with the transition within our economy, whether it's agriculture, whether it's an innovation, whether it's in whatever we're trading, it's going to have to look sustainable in the future. Um, and Germany's grappling also, I think, with some of these similar issues. It's got an energy transition that it really has to move fast on. And so there's some powerful drivers there to work together. Um, and, you know, Germany brings scale, it brings heft, um, it brings finance, it brings ideas. And I would say also New Zealand brings, we're a great place to do um, product testing. We've got a great uh, um, uh, educated um, uh, uh, population and we've also got ideas and innovation going through. So I've been really struck with the, the vibrancy of that partnership and I'm determined while I'm here. Um, people often talk about the, the, the trade part of, of that, but the economic part of our relationship, I think would surprise so many people of just how large it is. Um, you know, Germany is 40% larger economy than France or the UK. And, you know, nothing really is, happens in the European Union without, without a, a Germany imprint on it. So um, I think for me, that is the area around that sustainability side, which I think is so crucial for New Zealand's future prosperity. Nicole, your surprising moment. Yeah, so uh, I just I can just echo um, Craig. So I was impressed um, by the strong cooperation uh, in terms of science and research. As I said, there are so many German universities around here in New Zealand. And this is so amazing because there is no place further away from New Ze from Germany than New Zealand. So, um, and I was before I came to New Zealand, I was the head of the unit um, International Cooperation in Science um, in the Auswärtiges Amt in the Foreign Ministry. So the Foreign Ministry, we are funding all these um, German Academic Exchange Service and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and so on. We provide a lot of uh, scholarships. And I think this is such an important field in foreign policy um, so the these pillar of exchange young 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 people you know and uh, so um, this I would like to to strengthen even more um, there's a good basis but I would like to strengthen really the students exchange maybe for providing um, more scholarships or, or, or so so um, I um, I arrived in New Zealand uh, in September, as I said, and I'm still exploring my priorities, my two or three projects I want to implement after my three years here. Um, but um, uh, science and uh, technology is um, uh, definitely uh, one of uh, the focus. And then, of course, um, more cooperation in um, renewable energy, in um, um, combating climate change, um, uh, in in New Zealand, of course, and um, and uh, in Europe. So these are the two two topics. Thank you. Well, thank you to both ambassadors. Now, of course, we've still got about seven or eight minutes to go, and all the hands are going up. So, William Ralston, good to see you here. So, over to you. Uh, thanks, Sedon. It's um, uh, it's been actually a fascinating conversation, and um, and very pleased to be taking part in it. 
and it's raised a, a million questions for me around um, you know China looking like they might start to take sides in the Ukraine war and the um, uh, the, the relevance for permanent seats on the Security Council, but I actually want to uh, touch on climate change. And, uh, uh, you know, Germany's shown some real leadership in the climate change space. Um, New Zealand is looking to, um, uh, well, it already has its farmers paying um, into the uh, emissions trading scheme through um, fossil fuels, but now is now looking to charge its farmers for uh, biological emissions. And I really uh, wanted to know from um, Ambassador um, Menzenbach what um, approach uh, Germany is taking with, with its farmers and uh, around biological emissions and what can you know, New Zealand learn um, from your approach? Yeah, so um, it's a difficult question and um, takes a long answer, I think. Um, uh, so yeah, the. The farmers' lobby, as in New Zealand, um, is in Germany very strong. And um, uh, what I experienced here with the farmers' demonstration, we have this in Germany as well. So yeah, it's uh, it's um, you have to have a, a concrete approach to 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 the farmer lobby. Um, but I'm really not an expert on this. Um, uh, maybe Craig can <laughs> say something about um, how you approach the, the New Zealanders farmers lobby. Um, I don't know. Well, 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 thank you anyway. I think we better keep the questioning going. Otherwise, we might uh, not get to the end. But uh, Nina Hall. Hello, hello from Bologna. Great to um, see this event and some very familiar faces. So thank you so much to the Aspen Institute. Nice to see you again, Stormy, for, for hosting this. Um, I have a question about the underlying values in this relationship and apologies because I missed the beginning if that's been mentioned. But what strikes me about the two foreign ministers right now is we have Annalena Baerbock, who's outlined a strong feminist foreign policy and the Naya Mahuta who came out in her first foreign policy speech at Waitangi with bicultural values, manakitanga. I wondered for each of you, what does this mean for your foreign policy? What does a feminist foreign policy mean vis-a-vis -vis the New Zealand relationship and more broadly? And how does Mahuta's uh, approach influence what you do? And I say that out of a curiosity, but also because I teach my students. And last week we were discussing exactly this and they could argue it's just rhetoric. It doesn't actually change the day-to-day -day business. So, how does it change and influence the day-to-day -day business? These values. Well, who's going first? <laughs> um, I, I mean, maybe I, I, I'll, I'll quickly um, make make a few make a few comments. I mean, I, I think that um, countries have um, interests and values, and um, on the values side. Um, I would say that those issues, you know, on the feminist foreign policy and 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 our, our minister's um, characterization um, of of um, the, the values based foreign policy are anchored in our values around uh, the respect for multilateral rules based order, human rights, democratic institutions, um, the, uh, you know, um, open and own free and transparent. Um, uh, uh, waterways, and uh, th these are the kind of drivers um, that I think uh, we share in common with, 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 with Germany. And I would characterize those are the values that 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 come from our uh, around that human rights and multilateralism that bring up bring us together. And um, you know, and and within that, you know, things like um, uh, commitment to gender equality. That runs through um, not only our own societies domestically, but it runs through our foreign policy. Thank you, Craig. Nicole? Um, yeah, so feminist foreign policy is a, an important uh, issue for our foreign uh, minister, Annalena Baerbock. And um, I think we are very, very close together, New Zealand and Germany. It's about um, participation of women in the in the political process in business and so on you had a very um, a prominent uh, prime minister Jacinda Ardern you have a 
um, uh, foreign policy, uh, foreign minister um, with Mahuta and uh, Minister of Mahuta. So um, the thing to to in, to have an inclusive approach to uh, to get more women into politics and foreign politics because we will change and um, it, it's 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 a different approach of women to politics, uh, to the negotiation process and so on. So I think we are very close, we both um, uh, together. Um, uh, Germany is um, of course with Annalena Baerbock very progressive um, in, this, um, in this field, but um, there is no, um, we, are, we, are, we, we are on the same page, I would say. I'm sure that'll help your students, uh, Nina. Now, can we go to uh, Olaf? Morgenstern? Yes, so I'm, I should say I'm a German climate researcher based here in Wellington, New Zealand, uh, and I'm really heartened by what both uh, Craig Hawk and Nicole Menzenbach just said about the, the importance of research in the relationship and also the importance of specifically research into climate change. And of course, New Zealand has a massive challenge exemplified by last week's um, cyclone that really wreaked havoc and it, 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 it sort of shows the, um, the, the challenge in adapting to what's coming our way. So it's not just, uh, of course, cutting out greenhouse gases, it's about adapting to climate change. And, uh, you know, I would hope that well, our relationship with Germany could be helpful there in, in you know, in both directions. And also in terms of, um, you know, agricultural greenhouse gases, New Zealand is a world leader in that sort of field. Uh, and could support Germany in making a transition to having a sustainable agriculture. Sorry, it's not a question, but uh, I'd like to some comment from both of you, please. <laughs> well, we've, we've just about run out of time, but we'll see if we get cut mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. Nicole? Was it a question? Sorry. No question. I just, I just, I just want, to, want to say thank you for highlighting the importance of climate change and research into this. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is. Uh, and you're most welcome to make contact if you like, uh, if you want to broaden your understanding of what's going on here. So Morgenstern sounds German. Indeed, it's I'm German. You're you're a living example of this um, New Zealand uh, German cooperation. So it's right. uh, great to see the evidence on the screen. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, I think back to you. Um, well, there is, if I just very briefly, there is a very, very uh, last question in, in the chat. And um, I don't know if any of you would like to answer. Um, would the speakers be willing to comment on the United States rejection of the WTO panel findings and its assertion that the national security provisions in the gut are self-judging? I love that question because I'm a trade specialist, but it might be a little bit too technical for our um, panel, but um, let's give it a try. <laughs> well, Craig, you've done a bit of trade work, haven't you? I know. Now we're really going global, aren't we? We're really moving into it. I'm not, I mean, um, I won't comment. I don't know enough about that specific one. But other than to say it's pretty self-evident, as I mentioned around our, our commitment around multilateralism and international rules, that the WTO is incredibly important for us and um, having the, um, uh, the dispute panel resolution process working um uh for for us is um is vital i think for for the fairness um and in international um rules so um I, i'll probably leave it at there i i mean maybe if it just uh, i don't know if I get a chance to say i just want to thank very much this the, the for the conversation here and uh encourage all those um who can who may be eligible as to uh look for the working holiday scheme in new zealand um uh don you so don you made a comment about that before we had 17,000 young Germans working and living in, in New Zealand under the scheme previously, and there's huge demand again, but uh, um, they're our, our future alumni back here, Nicole, of, of Friends of, of New Zealand. And uh, and also can I acknowledge, um, Sir Martin, good to see you as well. It's been a while. This is what's so great about these. Uh, you can connect with people that uh, 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 you haven't seen for a while. Um, my final comment is to say, is a perhaps a little provocative one, is to say, while we're having this good conversation about Germany and New Zealand, I would also argue that I don't think that, that I think the relationship is undercooked. And I think 
uh, there's more to be done within New Zealand around understanding where Germany sits within our our security and prosperity framework. I think if you ask New Zealanders, they would go immediately to the UK, they'd probably say France, and then they might say Germany. But actually, um, you know, as I've mentioned, the largest science and research partner um, globally, um, it's our largest trading partner in the European Union by far. Um, it's the largest economy. Um, it's, it's the largest heavyweight in the European Union. Um, all I'm saying is what you will see in the future, I think, is um, more Germany in the relationship with New Zealand, um, given those um, that heft and those um, statistics and that framework. And that includes Germany coming back into and uh, into the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. I just want to jump in here. Yeah, this is my this is my goal. I'm working on that, you know, to uh, promote Germ more Germany um, uh, uh, to New Zealand and to the New Zealanders, promote um, opportunities, studying um, in Germany, um, doing business with Germany. And so, um, yeah, this is my this is my goal. And I don't want to miss to mention that we are celebrating 70 years of diplomatic relation this year. So this is a very good year and a very good um, point to, to connect here and to, to enhance our, um, our um, deep partnership and friendship. And um, so for me, this is my first ambassador's um, job. Uh, I was Consul General before, and um, I'm happy that's New Zealand. Um, we are friends, we are partners, and um, there's a lot of, um, so many opportunities. We can, we can deepen our friendship and expand our friendship. So, yeah, just wanted to say thank you for this wonderful conversation, and so, so happy to meet you all, and maybe we can meet up in Wellington. I would be really looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador Nicole. Thank you, Ambassador Craig. And uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, this is uh, a great exercise that we really enjoy from Aspen, New Zealand. It enables us to stretch ourselves around the world. And thank you, Christine. And I think you can give us the end blessing. <laughs> Well, thank you, Don. Um, once again, leading a very dynam dynamic conversation. I feel that the conversation has only just begun. Um, we're all having to look um, outwards um, after having been very introspective during the COVID year. So um, this was a great initiative um, amongst the Aspen International Partners. Um, so we do hope to carry on with um, Aspen Germany. Thank you um, for um, organizing and uh, 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 facilitating um, that, that this, to bring this conversation to everyone um, on both sides of the world. And uh, thank you, um, ambassadors. Um, uh, really fascinating. And I love the, the comment that it's undercooked. And so we need to do something about that. And we are. <laughs> so with that, Stormy, did you want to say anything? Just thank you and uh, hope to see you soon mm. again. <laughs> thank you. With that, we'll close.